My name is Eddie, and I was in a call. All of you have chosen something different. You have the light to shape the world around you. It has become my hope that this will set me free, because I'm haunted. Nothing in my life makes sense. My parents are a mess. Everything's just ripped apart. I will murder you before I let you take him from me. You know all the tactics then. That's my job, knowing what deception looks like. There was a man following us. I won't be blackmailed. Yes, you will. The light provides. It's all very delicate. Your fragile house of lives. It could collapse at any moment. The night is only beginning. Just to know that I'm awake. One more time. Oh. Let's hear it. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on season two of The Path. Uh, you shoot the entire season at one time, correct? Yes. I mean, not in like one you're day. Done, but you're done shooting it right now as it's yes, about to that's air right. because yeah. they're all going to come yeah, out. Yeah, we finished in, I want to say, October of last year. I'm always fascinated by the process because some of these some of these shows that do that they do they do go episode by episode and some of them they're shooting sort of different episodes in the middle of a day. Do you guys go episode by episode or I think I I mean I don't know many shows that that shoot across multiple episodes because that would kill the writers basically. We shoot two episodes at a time uh, and the reason for that is block shooting is in theory economical, you know, you can film two episodes worth of stuff in one location. And you can have one director per two episodes, so you'll have one director come in and you're with them for a whole month. There's a right. there's a benefit to that. You know, you have a rather than oh hey, I was just getting to know you and now you're gone and it's some other dude. Uh, what attracted you, Cal, from the to Cal from the beginning right away? He seemed so balanced, so safe. Um, no, I think it was that it was. Um, I spoke to uh, Jessica Goldberg, who's our showrunner. And, you know, this guy, he's, uh, you know, the, in a nutshell description, he's a cult leader. Um, and the risk for me there was that it become very, you know, moustache twirling and, and kind of uh, devious and, and, and melodramatic. And I thought that the reason that I liked the way she talked about Cal was the same reason I liked the way she talked about the whole show and all the characters was that she was really taking their faith very seriously, even if their faith is crumbling or, or you know, or, or maybe being used to the wrong ends, it's a very real thing for them. And that, I think, is why the show, I'd, I'd like to think that's why the show has legs. How much do you sort of yourself embed in the faith in order to understand Cal and understand the scenarios? Or are you able to kind of get a broad understanding of the faith and then it really becomes about the relationships and about the interpersonal struggles themselves? You mean, am I a practicing Myrist? Sure, yeah, let's uh, go there. No, no. How much have you bought into this? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I think it's more about <clears throat> buying into the specific need of the, you know, of the individual character, Cal, for the faith, um, or for faith, with, with a capital F, I suppose, um, and what his relationship is to that. But it does help that the, the details of the belief system are there. And it's incredibly detailed. And in a way, there's more and more added to that with every episode, because essentially the writers come up with more stuff. But before we started, we had a 10, 15 page kind of guide to the, the, the hierarchy of the, the structure of the religion and the, the vocabulary and, and essentially the basic beliefs and the myths. So yeah, that helps because you can kind of as you're thinking about a scene, if you're trying to imagine, okay, well, where's he going in his mind at this moment? Like, what, what is, what's emotional for him in this moment? You, you have something to hang that on rather than just the, the generalized idea of, of belief. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, it was more about thinking, getting into the mindset of somebody who's been inside a belief system since the age of five 
And I mean, in this case, it's a belief system that really fosters dependence and a kind of insularity. Um, but 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 it kind of could be any belief system. It happens to be this one. And then suddenly, age, whatever he is, he's in the 30s, that belief system is is threatened. And so, the, and this is season one, really. The need to defend that is as much as is, is about really self-defense. He's, he's like, I've got nothing else. This whole thing is propping me up. If this thing goes, I go with it. So, how much do you think his his defense, or sort of where he's coming from, and the secrets that he hides, are for the purpose of preserving the belief system, or preserving his the power that he's sort of just come into within that belief system? Right. Well, I think it's <laughs> initially it's probably the the former, and I, I think what happens in the in the first season is that it turns out that his um, his kind of selfless, if you can call it selfless behavior, like taking on all these secrets really for the sake of everybody else in the movement, starts to dovetail with his own ambition. Um, you're like, oh, I don't mind, it's not so bad at the top. You know, I, I kind of, you, with secrets come power, or maybe he thinks that. Um, and then the cracks start to show. And now where do we see his relationship going with Sarah in the second season now that she knows some of his secrets? Well, um, yes, it, it, uh, it starts, it's not so well, <laughs> in, initially at least. Uh, I think it's it's really interesting what Jessica and the writers did with this season, which is that they, you know, they they've taken these people who've lived, as I was saying, always enclosed and really almost frightened of the outside world. And as we were just talking earlier, in any second season of any TV show, you need to expand the world. But expanding these people's world is a very particular kind of thing to do. So Cal is out in the world trying to atone for his sins. He's trying, to, but he's also trying to spread the word. He wants to be out there and kind of reaching out to people. Um, Sarah is not so sure about that. She's much happier in the compound. Um, is he out there reaching out, sort of trying to ga gain more followers, kind of? Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to do outreach work. He's trying to work on the streets. I mean, he's trying to, he's trying to do the basic humanitarian work that he feels might, in some small way, heal the you know, paper over the cracks in his soul. <laughs> and Sarah doesn't believe that that's the way to go with? Well, Sarah is slowly but surely, uh, her world is becoming murkier because she has had to step into a position of power and compromise because she's agreed to a certain extent to, along with Cal, conceal the things that he's been concealing. Uh, and I think what's interesting is that Although Cal was very eager, almost desperate to have her there with him, alongside him, because he was lonely, essentially, as soon as she's there and he sees this change happening in Sarah, he's horrified and he starts to regret it and he starts trying to say to her, y you know, no, don't, don't, don't go down that road. I've been down that road. It's terrible. You need to be the person you always were and I need you to be that person because like, Sarah's always been on a pedestal for him and I think he was very happy keeping her on the pedestal. And you can imagine when somebody says to you, no, 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 stay on your pedestal. She's like, well, screw you, pal. <laughs> like, you yanked me off this pedestal. And so it gets, it gets a little messy. Now, when it comes to Cal, uh, he's not a kind of flamboyant and sort of wild cult leader in the, in the way that he sort of gives <laughs> I, mean, sermons. I try. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, I mean, I, I always look at cult leaders and I think of there's like Jim Jones and then there's David Koresh. And there's yeah. Jim Jones who was just wild and flamboyant and was sort of healing on stage and sort of going crazy. And then there's David Koresh, who you see footage of, and he was just sort of spoke quite normally as if everything he was saying was absolutely real and mm -hmm. true, and there was no reason to be bombastic about it. And that seems to be the kind of approach that you've taken with Cal in terms of how he speaks to his followers. Did you go and look at any sort of previous you know, cult leaders and, and think about which direction you would, you would go in? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to remember is that this guy isn't the original cult leader. He didn't originate this movement or religion or cult or whatever you want to call it. He's a kind of reluctant second generation leader. So he's not the Messiah. He's, uh, he's, um, he's a communicator. He's a bridge, right? I mean, I think that's the way he sees it. it, it he reluctantly finds himself in this position and then he thinks, okay, either we're going to sink or we're going to swim. And if we're going to swim, it's because I'm going to Certainly, you see this in the second season as well. Like, go out there and try and be a man of the world. And um, so, so yeah, it's more the latter. He was. He, I also, I think that look, we're making a TV show about a cult, and I'm not crazy about that word, but of course, we come back to that word. But I think if we'd been there screaming and sacrificing goats, and you know, everybody had to call me daddy or whatever, it would be we would not have lasted long. That <laughs> that that kind of thing would get boring pretty quick.
So did you sort of see that, feel that there was no sort of need or reason to go back and look at these sort of, uh, I would say iconic, maybe that's the wrong word, cult leaders of, uh, of our time? Because this person, this story was so much more focused on the interior design of this person rather than on like, you know, exposing what a cult looks like. Well, like I said, I thought there was a kind of inherited charisma that he had. I thought about what it was to have that charisma. I think that putting aside the idea of him wearing long robes and raving, I think anybody who can stand up in front of a crowd of people on a stage like that and draw them in has to have has to be very forceful, obviously, but also has to have humor, in fact. In Jim Jones is actually quite funny. I mean, um, you have to be surprising and you have to be able to talk very intimately to people. And, and he certainly has all of those colors. Uh, let's talk about Hannibal for a second. There's rumors all the time because of the show's creator, uh, Brian Fuller, who yeah. loves to likes throw, to start a rumor. Likes yeah. to start a rumor. I think the last rumor was that he'd like to see a Silence of the Lambs miniseries go forward with the characters from Hannibal. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Do you know of anything about that, or is that literally just something he said on Twitter for fun? <laughs> uh, no, I think I actually think that Brian's been quite consistent in what he said. I mean, maybe coming at it from different angles. But that, to me, is a fair description of what we had talked about as a fourth season before we knew that we weren't coming back for a fourth season. There's also an issue of rights, because um, we had the rights to Red Dragon, which is the first novel in the series, and all the characters stemming from that, but not to Silence of the Lambs. So Clarice Starling is out of bounds, but that could change. No. But the, the basic idea that there was a small, just a quite a small passage within Silence of the Lambs that he saw as an opportunity to take those characters forward was always on the cards. And is, I hope it's, I think it's still on the cards, but, but we're talking about down the line. When did you find out while doing the third season that you were not gonna get renewed for a fourth season? Oh, not till afterwards. There's no moment, if you're watching the third season, it's not like I stop acting at the eighth episode. And I was well, there's, there's always <laughs> been uh, rumors, I think a lot of fans believe that the show got so wild in the third season and sort of went, totally in the, the artist's own direction, kind of like uh, mm -hmm. getting, getting rid of any semblance of having to be a network procedural at that point that people thought that, they, that he kind of knew that there wasn't gonna be a fourth season. I mean, that would be a question for Brian. I don't think so. I think that if you look at the show, every season ended with Brian thinking, I think this could be the end, so I'm just gonna like, write it like it's the end and we'll see what happens. You know, um, Like every season finale felt like a series finale because we're all dying. <laughs> um, I actually think the show could never have survived as a, as a hybrid of a procedural slash episodic TV slash Brian Fuller crazy serial killer drama. It, was, it had to go more down that road. And I don't know if that, if that made it untenable. I, mean, on I loved it. I, That's what no, I loved No, 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 I understand it. it's not a criticism. Uh, I mean, I think, I think in a way the problem was that, that we were never gonna get the numbers that was gonna make it sustainable. And I give NBC actually like enormous credit and a lot of, gratitude because we probably shouldn't have been on air for as long as we were just on a pure numbers level. Well, someone clearly loved that show uh, at that network because it was always a question every season. They're like <laughs> Hannibal's numbers aren't that great, but we as critics love it. And then, and well, then that counts for renewed. something, of course. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it definitely, I think it abandoned the, not necessarily, not totally abandoned, but the procedural element of the show did more so go away. I think in the first, like halfway through the first season, it sort of ended up bleeding into a much more serialized TV show. Yeah, that's for sure. That's true. And and I mean, it was true that in every season, even though in the first season we had more of a kind of crime of the week situation, uh, in every season I would have a conversation with Brian. He'd say, "His," I'd say, "Okay, what's the image at the end of this season that that I can kind of drive towards?" And the first season it was, "You're going to throw up an ear." Like, okay, that's I can I can run with that, you know. <laughs> the other stuff is almost it's just noise. I'll just think about the ear, you know. What was the second? Can I ask what the second and the third one were? Uh, the the third one was the second one was turning into uh, Hannibal's knife, and what that and the idea of that as a kind of embrace. Um, I mean, we talked a lot about what that was. Like, okay, but I've got a gun. Why am I going to let? I mean, on a really basic level, why am I going to let him gut me if I've got a gun? Well, there's more than this. Is not just a piece of action. It's a, it's a kind of consummation, right, of something. What is it? A consummation, or a consummation of. So that, that again, that's that's much more helpful than thinking, you know, about whatever little crime we're investigating in the seventh episode. Let's say it's like, well, where are we on that pr progression?
Now, I have to ask, when you signed on to be a part of the TV show Hannibal, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there was a lot, for viewers who, you know, who love Silence of the Lambs, I love Silence of the Lambs. I think it's one of the great thrillers of all time. When Red you, Dragon, let's not forget that. Oh, yeah, Red, Manhunter as well. It's just Actually, unbelievable. I'm sorry, I meant Manhunter. But Red Dragon, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, when you signed on, did you have any trepidation? Were, were, you, were you worried about what they were going to do with it? Did you think, okay, I'll, I'll do this show, maybe it's just going to be a procedural? Or had Brian Fuller sort of fully explained to you his vision that it was going to be something totally wild for, for network? Brian people? is one of the great pitch men in the world. So the, the show he described to me was like entirely, it was like his mind palace, right? It was, it was fully imagined and it was... Um, you know, beautiful. And then I would say that the procedural element was negotiated more as we made the first half of the first season and he was still in back and forth with the network and everybody was figuring out what the show was going to be. So I was more conscious of the full four season or whatever he described like this massive arc to me. And that's what I was focused on. The show and also I have to say that, sorry, in terms of, in terms of like allegiance to previous adaptations and so on, I definitely felt that. But I was also very, very early on, like Brian, fully committed to making, trying to make sure that Mads would be on board. And I, and I knew Mads, and I knew that we would be okay if that were the case. So that, that relieved my anxiety. Not necessarily Mads is, but I was fine. You know? <laughs> uh, the, the, the deaths and the, the sort of carnage of Hannibal is unbelievably gory and beautiful all at the same time. Was there ever a particular... Uh, body or, or scene in the show that, that grossed you out that you, you yourself couldn't handle? Um, the only one was when M Mads um, goes to... I, I can't remember who's the doctor and, and, he, and he cuts his uh, head right open and <laughs> pulls it back into a gaping kind of grin. Um, I... I I, you know, I had just done a scene with the guy. We, I, I, he's, I, he's a good, he's a friend, and I come in and see the prosthetics. I, oh God, you know, that, I actually that was the only time I had to take a little moment. Otherwise, I loved it. I, I loved. I got. A, I developed a very intimate and friendly relationship with Fake Blood on that show. Now, I, I would imagine that you 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 get offered lots of roles, especially in television. But how often is it do you find that you get roles like Cal in the Path, or like your role in Hannibal, or just shows like these that? go as deep as they can, episode by episode. Look, there's a lot of amazing television um, on air right now. Too much for any human being to watch. Um, so I, I'd be lying if I said, well, these are the only two shows and the only two roles that have been written like this ever, and I'm just so lucky I got both of them. Um, but at the same time, I mean, like begets like. I, I think I know the first conversation I had with Jessica was... Um, her saying strangely, I'm so happy Hannibal was canceled. Like, yeah, well. Um, but but the, actually the appeal for me was that I could see the potential in the show. You never know how a show's gonna go, right? You, you, you're obviously taking a leap of faith, so to speak. But um, in the same way that you never know how a movie's going to go uh, as well, like no, someone sells you no, on a vision, an idea. No, that's true. You, you don't. It's always collaborative, and there's always a hundred things that could go wrong, and it's more likely to go wrong than not. And you have no control over the, the process, the post-production, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe the world just won't be interested in what you're interested in. But at least in a movie, you have the complete framed piece before you start, right? And in a TV show, obviously, you have a couple of scripts from something that is just going to keep growing and growing. So um, there's a different kind of uncertainty. But, but what I did know was that uh, the feeling for me, I mean, like my little job was going to be, was going to feel very different because even though there's a darkness and they're both quite, they, they do go in depth, they actually felt like the characters were quite distinct and quite different. And, and the tone, you know, the tone of Hannibal was so elevated in such a particular, yeah. unique to Brian, really, way. And this show is elevated because they're all living in this weird, specific situation. But for all of that, we're always trying to make it, well, 85% of the time, trying to make it as naturalistic as we can. And that was not true of Hannibal. That was different. Well, yeah, that, and I think that's what's so interesting and so, and so different about The Path when you first start watching it is that it is so clearly creators and actors trying to bring it down to earth because it already exists, as you said, in a kind of elevated Place. But you don't need to give it an extra layer of crazy. They're in full crazy already. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. They exist in crazy day to day. So. Yes, and to be fair, I mean, actually, 
day to day, they're not crazy. Day to day, they're just dealing with their existence. I mean, Cal's is a bit more mad um, because he's got all these secrets. I mean, from the get go, his is a bit more fraught. But broadly speaking, people are carrying on with their lives. They've been in it for 30, 40 years. They're just like paying the bills and, you know, they have their relationships. And um, I think that's a pretty accurate depiction of, of, this, of, of this type of insular community. And in fact, it's also, I thought, a very fair depiction of why somebody might want to join that kind of a group. And it's something I think that any of us, religious or otherwise, could perhaps identify with. And again, that's, if you, if you can't, if you don't get that feeling from the show, if you don't get that feeling of, oh, this is something beautiful about this, and there's a certainty that these people have which is appealing, and there's a kindness even, and a supposed transparency, if you can't get all of that, then, then we failed, for sure. Now, you're, you're an actor who... But we didn't, so we didn't fail, okay? <laughs> You started on the stage for, for the most part, right? Is that true? Uh, I mean, a bit of, I did, like, going way back to when I was at, at school. I mean, like, high school. Um, but professionally, I did, a, I was, it was in London. I did a bit of TV, but a bit, kind of a bit of everything all at the same time. Again, not literally all at the same time. But um, I would say it took a while of working in TV and film before I got a chance to go back and do some theater, which is where, what had kind of got me into it in the first place. And since then, I've had a few more chances. Do you sort of, are you like most actors or most actors who've done theater, do you sort of always, are you always looking for the opportunity to sort of go and do theater whenever you can? Or at least, can? like most actors, claiming that I'm looking like, for yeah. the opportunity. Theater is really my true <laughs> I just love. can't wait to get back to the theater. Um, <laughs> real acting exists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, of course, having said that, now I, <laughs> I've, I've boxed really myself in a bit. <laughs> like, um, Go for it. I think that if I'm honest, I, I, yes, I am. I mean, it's been, in my case, it's been about six years. It was just before Hannibal. When I met Brian, I was doing a play here in New York on, on Broadway. And I think, weirdly, also being in the theater can act as a, as a, as a kind of you know, good window display. For like, like, oh, I'll have him in my TV show. You know? And then you're like, oh, I guess I won't be doing theater for a while. Um, for me, the grass is always greener. So you know, you're halfway through a six-month shoot. You're like, wow, I I could be you know in the theater and, and just going to work in the evenings. And um, but also, the schedule of of any any filming schedule is so so rapid. Um, and by definition, you do one thing onto the next, and the theater you go back, you do it again, you you explore it, you explore it more and more. So yeah, when I'm doing one, I always wish I was doing the other. You are the first actor I've ever talked to who's ever described theater as the easier uh, of the three. You just get to work in the evening. Usually, like, I oh, mean, that, that was, crime. even as I said that, I thought that's, there's nothing like, that's not true. But <laughs> no, then I had, I had said it and it was too late. So. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has questions out here? You do. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Okay, first time speaking on a mic, so I don't know if anyone can. You're doing an amazing okay, job. Great. Keep it up. So I've seen you in The Pride and Venus and Fur, and of course your shows on TV and film and whatnot. And you play such emotional characters, rather that if they're as, as aggressive as Cal in The Path or Hannibal or as emotional as in Venus and Fur, how do you find yourself when it comes to like, how do you meditate or like come out of character? Like how do you go back home after a day and like hang out with your son and not be like, oh my God, I just murdered three people on television. <laughs> But I mean, for me anyway, the end to that sentence would be, oh my God, I just murdered three people on television. Yeah! <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, I mean, I, I, thank you, first of all, um, for watching all those things. I think that if, if something is emotional, that's all well and good, but, but it has to be from a place, kind of a specific place, right? I mean, just to keep me interested and to have something to hopefully make you interested. So um, that means that you've got something to work on, and if it's in the theater, something that hopefully you can do better than you did the night before, and if it's in TV, just to nail it, because you're not gonna get to do it again. Um, and whether that's dark, I mean, I did a play here called Journey's End, and at the end of the play, every single evening, I had to march out to my death. <laughs> and they, but it was with a great group of actors, and it was an amazing play, so I go home at the end of the evening thinking, yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, I just, I like my job. Um, I like to go home and have a beer, maybe. I mean, but I mean, I think that's not unusual. Uh, so I don't. I'm just not one of those actors that has to go home and sit in a corner and you know suffer. Can I ask what was uh, who was the actor or what was the movie or play that really sort of made you want to be an actor, made you want to be a part of it? 
I don't, I don't know. Actually, I was, it wasn't like I suddenly had this, saw somebody else doing it and had a dream that I then pursued for it. It was, I was at school and um, I, I wasn't particularly, hadn't figured out what to do. I wasn't particularly enjoying it. And somebody came along and said, oh, we're doing a play and you're going to be in it. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So I was. Um, and and I really liked it, you know. So it was. <laughs> that, that's. I wish I could tell something that was a little less passive, but that's kind of just how it landed on me. And then, and but then from that point on, it was like, okay, well, that decision has been has has already happened for me. Like I, I'd never had to stop and ponder it. So then I was just running with it. Uh, next question. So I think you're gonna have to tell Brian. We're gonna need a chapter number on that little passage <laughs> for Anna. We're gonna see you guys soon, so. Uh -huh. just be ready. Um. Yeah, uh, yeah. You're talking about the the Hannibal. The yeah. Uh, yeah I the think. Well, Brian is like I was saying earlier. He's consistent, <laughs> but he's consistently kind of vague. So I think it would take um, a lot oh, of. Oh yeah, to, not no chapter numbers. Yeah. I think that's vague enough. <laughs> but um, so this is less of a question, more of a response to an article that came out with you yesterday, where you said you weren't positive why the Hannibal devotion was like what it was and obviously here we are so mm. I pulled the fandom and I'm we thought your answer was pretty on point but also I think it really comes down to three things which are the show the team and the community yeah. um, and the show is just so beautiful and incredible but also like nuanced and obscure enough that we can like still three years later sit in a bar and argue over what Hannibal's intention in that one scene in Hassoon really was. Yeah. Um, and then the team is so open and we always felt like equals as fans. Yeah. And that's not exactly a common thing always on TV. So to feel that we were really accepted by everyone and that everyone was really loving of the show and we loved the show and everyone was fans together. Yeah. That was really I think that's completely right. And actually, I mean, I... I on this occasion, I would just say on my own behalf that you know not everything gets printed in an article. So I was saying something actually quite similar, which is that um, like I think like I said to her that that show is the gift that keeps on giving, and the reason for that is not just because yeah, what a great show. It's because there is this community around it, and it feels very very inclusive. And I think for all the reasons that you just described so very eloquently, that there's still people still finding more to you know to discover in it and argue about and talk about. Um, but that there is a, like, the, the, the gift goes both ways, right? And I'm very appreciative of that. Did you, as the actor, sort of argue and discuss what, what was going on in the show and exactly what was in Brian's head while you were shooting it? Uh, he, maybe. I mean, I think, I, I, like, I, I've always thought that, in a sense, uh, we did early on, maybe more so. I mean, a lot of that you do on your own before you get started, and then once you go, you, the rigors of a schedule just define how much you can talk. But I also think that, uh, to some extent, ha happily working with another actor is defined in part by if they like to talk exactly the same amount as you do, you know? And then you like, at, you, at exactly the same moment, you arrive at the point where, I kind of think, we've talked enough, let's just do it. And M Mads and I certainly always had that, I think, quite similar approach. Uh, I would say the same with, uh, <laughs> with that skull. No, with, um, <laughs> with, no, I'm looking at the poster, but with, with Michelle, I worked much less with Aaron this year, um, uh, which was, kind of very sad but but when we do come together it feels exactly the same like we want to make sure we know where we are and why we're there and then there's a certain amount you reserve for yourself and then there's a certain amount you just leave to figure out while you're doing it the hope that it arrives in the moment next question right here hey you uh, hey. so i was wondering do you uh are you, do you feel like you're at that point in your career where you can kind of choose where you want to t uh, go and can like pick the roles that you want or are you still like kind of figuring things out or trying something different? Uh, I mean, I think certainly not. I don't feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm good from here. You know, I, I think that never, I, well, clearly there's a small list of people for whom that is true. Um, <clears throat> I think that I'm lucky to have more, more choice or at least more opportunity. Um, but I also think that ha having any feeling that you know where you're going or, or the, in, as an actor, unless you're a writer as well, um, and a producer and et cetera, et cetera, which, which I'm not. I mean, I don't particularly aspire to be those things. So you're, you're slightly putting yourself at the mercy of fate and whatever comes through your door, you know? Um, so, so I feel, 
I, I feel you know really glad that that I know that there's people like if the path ended tomorrow I, I'd be able to go out and talk to people that I really respect and maybe something would come of it but I wouldn't know what that might be I think we have time for one more question right here yeah um hi hey I was wondering, um, because your character on the Hannibal and the Path are really different, mm. so what is like your takeaway for like future roles based on your experience in both shows that you'll have for other roles? You, like, would it be nice to play somebody just really relaxed and <laughs> <laughs> in a happy relationship? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it would. Um, I, I, think, I think that you can't really, um, it, it never really works to make a, 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 a think about this is who I want to play next because it might be that you do, like I was just saying to answer the last question it's very dependent on what comes through your door and what you're looking for is something that's specific right that's rich and multifaceted and um, so you have to keep your mind open to whatever that might be and at the same time like be wary that oh just be careful you're not just going through your greatest hits or, or what somebody else might think of as your greatest hits you know what do you think of as your, as your greatest oh, hits? God, I knew as I said that. I knew I shouldn't have said that. Sorry. <laughs> Just, uh, this, I can't get away with anything here. Um, I, I don't personally think that way. <laughs> God damn it. Um, no, no uh, one really No, no one really I suppose knows. what I mean is that, is that um, <clears throat> to, to, some, to somebody, you don't want to feel that you were being hired because somebody saw what you just did and think, oh, he's really good at that thing. He can do that. And I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to try and say what that was, but, but I don't think that would be a recipe for success. It might be a recipe for another great gig, but in the long run, it's probably not very smart, so that's what I meant. Did I avoid your question well enough? That was great. Go that was Thank great. You. So as, a, as an actor, do you find that uh, you're kind of looking for challenges as much as you can when you take on the next role? Are you at least hoping that this is going to challenge you as much as the last one? That's so much fairer as a question. Um, Trying to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so as an actor, I do. I look for challenges. Um, <laughs> uh, no, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You do, I mean, you want to be, look, in TV, you don't know how long you're going to be there, but you could be there for, you know, we've done two years on the path. I, ho I hope very much, and I'm optimistic we'll do a third, maybe a fourth and a fifth. Like, you'd better be, have something to keep you interested because that's a long haul. And um, just for your own you know, quality of life, you, you want to be sure that there's something there for you to dig away at and be sure that the people you're working with are going to, you know, be challenging and, and, and collaborative. And, and I mean, if there's anything that these two TV shows that I've been part of have in common, it's, it's that. It's the feeling that I, if this goes on, I'll be, I'll be very happy to plow on ahead. Yeah. How often do you uh, watch your, your shows? Like, do you watch, did you watch Hannibal when it was airing? Do you, did you watch The Path or do you have trouble watching yourself? Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I. I do watch. I don't. I don't necessarily always love it, but I tend to watch. But not religiously. And Brian would would often send uh, you know a link kind of early on when he's putting it together because he was excited, um, and and actually likewise with the path, but but I find that it's it's good to get a bit of peace of mind. Like oh, that's what we were doing. You know that that's the world we're being being putting together. And this I'm not I'm not crazy, and 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 it does all kind of fit together and then maybe let it go. And then it, that can also kind of shape your performance moving forward a little bit as well, right? Yeah, but that's the danger as well. I mean, that in a, in a way, that's not like, un, un, that's a bit like having your own internal critic. It's like reading your criticism, you know, in the papers or whatever. I just aged myself, but you know, wherever you read your criticism. In the papers. On AOL, obviously. <laughs> also aged yourself there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, you, you can do that to yourself. You don't need to hear somebody else's voice. If you watch your own performance, you can't help but for, I like that bit, I didn't like that bit, and you can carry that stuff with you. So there's a, there's a value to it, but, it's, uh, but it comes with some, some risk as well. Well, Hugh, thanks so much for being thank here. Thank you. Uh, the Path Season 2 premieres January 25th on Hulu. Hugh, thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. One more time.